This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Stick around to the end to find out how you can make a stunning website. Hello everybody, welcome to Mike's Mike. My name is being reported to be and being distributed across the blogs as Mike. Today I'm talking about a movie that I have not stopped thinking about since the first time I saw it 13 years ago. Well, yes, this video is about Zack Snyder's 2011 film Sucker Punch. You have all the weapons you need. Now fight. This movie is so movie, and you need to understand that. We will be getting in our analytical bag a little bit more than usual this video, so let's get those brain cells warmed up. I am so natural light coded right now. Yep, no one's ever been more natural or more light. The first thing worth mentioning is that there's actually three versions of Sucker Punch. There's the theatrical release, which means the version released in theaters in March, 2011. The extended cut, which was included on the Blu-ray release in June, 2011. And an unreleased director's cut. I'm gonna be talking about the extended version, which actually has 17 minutes of extra content and is actually R rated, whereas the theatrical release was PG-13. That 17 minutes to me, to me, adds a lot to the movie. <laughs> So of all the movies, why am I talking about Sucker Punch? Basically, I think it's really interesting. Yeah. And you're going to hear me say the word interesting and perhaps interesting many times throughout this video because the movie is interesting, yes. The discourse around this movie was a mess from day one or even before day one. It's stylistically an interesting film, feels a little bit Tim Burton-esque. And I guess overall, I'm just surprised that it even got made by Zack Snyder. The Justice League guy. And that gagged me a little bit. You can definitely see his style of filmmaking come through in parts, especially during, you know, speed ramping in the action scenes, which are great, and I'll point them out. <laughs> oh my God, the action scenes are so good. Almost unnecessarily good. And the extended cut adds a bunch more. So let's celebrate that. Couple of things to tap into before we get stuck into the movie. This one is for the discourses. Ye whomst love to partake in discourse. Just because a movie has nasty characters does not mean the movie is endorsing said nasty characters just by having them in the movie. Or if something happens in a movie, it happening does not mean that the movie is saying what happened is okay. It sounds like common sense when I say it, but then I'll see stuff on Twitter and I'll think, Oh, that's not... Second thing, this movie's quite polarizing. Yes, magnets. Come on, disclosure. Some people really like it, and some people really hate it and think it's the worst movie ever made. I personally think it's so movie. Like, it is so movie. I haven't given it a star rating on Letterboxd because I can't articulate my review beyond it's so movie, but I have added it to my favorites. It's just such a movie. If you watch this video and you think, Arr. <laughs> Arr, that boy yonder doesn't know fucking shit. That's so fair and dare I say real. That moment when deliberately ambiguous scenes are interpreted differently from person to person. Enough yapping, what actually is Sucker Punch? Warner Brothers says, Sucker Punch is an epic action fantasy that takes us into the vivid imagination of a young girl whose dream world provides the ultimate escape from her darker reality. Unrestrained by the boundaries of time and place, she is free to go where her mind takes her and her incredible adventures blur the lines between what is real and what is imaginary. While that is what happens in the movie, I'm kind of like, but is that what the movie is about? No. It also kind of makes it sound a bit too fluffy. The girls over at IMDb are a little bit more succinct. A young girl institutionalized by her abusive stepfather retreats to an alternative reality as a coping strategy and envisions a plan to help her escape. I would say that's more accurate. Then we have the trailer. I think this trailer won like the IGN trailer of the year for 2011 or something. You control this world. I would say this is a very good trailer, but again, also a little bit misleading asterisk. What are you looking for? A way out. I'm going to help you to be free. Misleading asterisk because it looks like most of the movie is about hot girls with weapons killing monsters, which is true. It's the only way we can get out of here. But that's also quite a surface level representation of the movie if that makes any sense. It'll make sense when I go through the plot. It's very correct when the text pops up saying, you will be unprepared. Also interesting when you find out that Zack Snyder wanted to market the movie as hot girls with weapons killing monsters to get men into the cinema and then gag them a bit with what the movie's actually about. In an interview with Comic Book Debate, he said, I'm always shocked that it was so badly misunderstood. I always said that it was a commentary on sexism and geek culture. Someone would ask me, why did you film the girls this way? And I'd say, well, you did. Sucker Punch is a fuck you to a lot of people who will watch it. Interesting. 
Interesting. He also said that Warner Brothers heavily altered his initial cut to make it less explicit because they didn't want to offend anybody. And it seems like because of these edits, when the movie came out, it became this big poster child for exploitation of women in movies when that's exactly what Zack Snyder was trying to comment on. It's kind of crazy because if you watch the movie without that context, it does feel a bit sexist and misogynist. But then with that context and the extra stuff in the extended version, it feels like a completely different movie. It's worth noting that even the extended cut isn't fully what Snyder's vision was. Release the Snyder cut. Right? Release the Snyder Cut. Okay, let's movie. Let us movie together. This particular video is so team sport because this movie isn't on streaming anywhere. Physical media, you will be avenged. And I will be the Avenger. Word to Thanos. We are immediately with the theory bullshit straight out the gate. The first line of the movie is a character named Sweet Pea saying, Everyone has an angel, a guardian who watches over us. We can't know what form they'll take. One day old man, next day little girl. But don't let appearances fool you. They can be as fierce as any dragon. Now, interestingly, when she says next day little girl, we first see baby doll. Remember that for later. 20 year old baby doll is played by Emily Browning. And the first scene of the movie is a sort of stylized flashback to her finding out that her mother has died. While a spooky rendition of Sweet Dreams Are Made Of This by the Eurythmics sung by Emily Browning plays in the background. This real world sequence is very gray, grimy, scary, which could describe some of you, yes. But it's what the world of Sucker Punch looks like. It's giving 1960s, it's kind of giving Gotham, but there are no superheroes here to save the day. No, no, no. So the mum dies and baby doll and her sister are left with their scary looking stepfather who reads the mother's will and gets angry when he finds out she's left everything to the daughters. He goes to hurt baby doll, she scratches him in the face. And when he grabs her shirt, we get this shot. This was the first time I knew something serious was in the air with this movie. The perspective sort of implies that the button is big because it's close to the camera, but also kind of not. Like it's too big. It's kind of Alice in Wonderland-y giant button. So the evil abusive stepfather decides he's going to hurt Baby Doll's younger sister, so goes after her, locking Baby Doll in her room so she can't do anything about it, which prompts Baby Doll to climb outside and scale the house to stop him from hurting her sister. Diva's supreme Baby Doll pulls up behind him with a gun from his office. Shoots him, misses, the bullet ricochets like Taylor Swift tears, and she accidentally kills her sister. She gets shipped off to Lennox House for the Mentally Unstable, which given the Eurythmics playing in the background, feels like an Annie Lennox reference. Quick moment of appreciation for the water on the window spelling out sucker punch. They said the thing. I love that shit. Voice over Sweet Pea is still yapping about guardian angels. We can deny our angels exist, convince ourselves they can't be real, but they show up anyway at strange places and at strange times. They can speak through any character we can imagine. They'll out through demons if they have to. Daring us, challenging us to fight. So Baby Doll gets dragged into this atrocious looking asylum. Again, Gotham vibes, half expecting Harley Quinn to pop around the corner. Seems like her evil stepdad has done a deal with dodgy Oscar Isaac. Instead of her just being locked up in the asylum forever, she's going to be lobotomized. <laughs> Also, when the stepfather's filling in Baby Doll's patient details for her name, he writes down M something, but we never actually get her real name. I've been calling her Baby Doll, but we don't actually hear her referred to as that until later on. He also ticks the boxes for her being violent, a danger to others, and unable to adapt to social situations. It's a setup. Oscar Isaac plays Blue Jones, an asylum orderly who has this key around his neck. He's dodgy. Dodge E. Dodgeball. Balls. He's taking Baby Doll to the theatre because Dr. Gorski likes to take a look at all the new girls. So this is what we call the theatre. So this is the asylum rec room, I guess. It's looking real rough in there. Apparently this Dr. Gorski, played by Carla Gugino, uses the theatre to help the girls with their issues by getting them to act out what happened to them. There's also an aspect of this therapy where Dr. Gorski gets the girls to create a world in their heads that they're in control of, but we'll get to that in a second. If we look here, we have three of our soon to be key characters around a table and Miss Abby Cornish up on the stage. The framing of this shot of Blue and the stepfather negotiating the lobotomy payment. I'm taking a really big risk here. So it's gonna have to be two grand even. Yeah, that's cinema. Blue says that the doctor who does the surgery is going to be here in five days. There's a lingering look between Baby Doll and onstage Abby Cornish, which I'm sure means nothing. Then there's a montage of Baby Doll observing and noticing things around the asylum. A lighter owned by an orderly, a map in Blue's office, a knife in the kitchen, the key around Blue's neck. And then this is where things start to get really confusing. It looks like Baby Doll is being prepared for her procedure and Dr. John Hamm's there and he's got this big surgical tool thing, but then this happens. Stop. 
get that thing away from me. Suddenly, being in the lobotomy chair is part of Abby Cornish's Sweet Peas theatre therapy session with Dr. Gorski. Instead of Dr. John Hamm, it's Jamie Chung's Amber. The nurses are Vanessa Hudgens' Blondie and Jenna Malone's Rocket. We are now in a different reality, which I'm going to call our second reality. Dr. Gorski is now Madame Gorski. Blue Jones is a pimp, and Lennox House seems to be a brothel slash burlesque lounge. Those theatre therapy sessions are now the girls preparing their performances for the club's clientele. What is this? Lobotomized vegetable? How about something a little more uh, commercial? I want to raise a question here, but it's kind of spoilery, so I'm going to flag it and pick it up again at the end. We pan across the rec room turned club and baby dolls there again with club owner Blue and the stepfather, but now the story's different. Don't tell me. The priest brought you here from the orphanage to lose your virginity, right? Let me rephrase that, to sell it. Yeah, that's right. How original. So instead of the specialist doctor coming to lobotomize baby doll in five days, it's now... Uh, the high roller's coming for in five days. He's gonna... Just do a little flower picking. That does not happen in the theatrical cut. It's sort of talked around, but immediately feels disconnected because Blue says the high roller is coming without the context of Baby Doll's innocence being sold. So it's just kind of like, okay, whatever that means. Blue asks Sweet Pea to show Baby Doll around the establishment. Sweet Pea. Baby Doll, Blondie, these are now the characters' names, but we didn't hear these names in the main reality. You know what I'm gonna say. It's interesting. So their names are terms that are frequently used to objectify women in this reality where the women are being exploited by Blue's club. Interesting. Also interesting, Baby Doll hasn't said anything yet. Sweet Pea says that she can't show Baby Doll around because she's too busy trying to get the show in order. So she gets her sister Rocket to do it. Blue owns the club. The club's a front for his business. Guns, gambling, medication, special favors. He brings in his clients and we gotta make him feel, you know, special. Feel special reference? You make me feel special. Rocket is played by Jenna Malone. Ugh. This diva. On IMDb trivia, it says that Jenna Malone was so upset by the film's poor reception that she almost quit acting. Can you imagine? How diabolical and terrible and the worst thing ever that would be considering two years later, she was Joanna Mason in Catching Fire. So Rocket gives Baby Doll a tour, points out a closet and says, this is where Blue puts us if we misbehave. Also interesting, the club interior stops when they get to a particular gate. It's rehearsal time. That's Amber, Blondie, and you've already met my sister, Sweet Pea. Rocket says that everyone gets a routine and when the male clients come to watch the performances, if they like what they see, they pick the performer, etc, etc. Again, not in the theatrical cut. We then get a high camp performance of Blue and Madame Gorski singing Love is the Drug while the girls get ready and then do their performances. Love is the drug and I need to score. This is one of the big differences between the versions because this entire scene is not in the theatrical cut and I think it actually adds a lot. First of all, Oscar Isaac with this musical theatre eatery. Mm. Hello? Get him on a stage, stat! Second, we don't see the girls' performances apart from this scene. So in the theatrical cut, it's kind of like, what are you divas even rehearsing for? Third, it's so camp and ridiculous that I think it helps to remind the viewer that this reality is not real. Hmm. Is there perhaps commentary being made here? The next day while cleaning the floor, Baby Doll overhears Rocket being attacked by the cook for stealing a piece of cooking chocolate. Then Baby Doll rescues Rocket and says her first line of the movie at the 24 minute mark. Let her go, pig. At dance rehearsal, Madame Gorski singles out Baby Doll to practice her dance to a remix of Army of Me by Björk. This mix. It is so fucking collapsed. The music in this movie is so good. And I also love that it just does not make any sense for this 1960s asylum to be playing Björk. <laughs> when I tweeted about doing a sucker punch video, someone said this, which made me giggle a bit. So initially Baby Doll doesn't dance and Madame Gorski says, if you don't dance, you have no purpose and we don't keep things here that have no purpose. It seems like the dancing is how the girls in this reality fight, which makes sense when we say what happens when they dance. You have all the weapons you need. You have all the weapons you need. Now fight. Yep. Mm-hmm. 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 So Baby Doll dances. You got to I now we're in a third reality where Baby Doll is in wintry Japan. And the visuals are so good. She goes into a temple and meets this man who says, what are you looking for? And baby doll says freedom. The man says he's going to help her, gives her a sword and a gun and says she needs five things for her journey to freedom. A map, 
fire, a knife, a key, and a mysterious fifth thing. Hmm, I seem to recall Baby Doll looking at all of those things in the asylum before we shifted to the second reality. The fifth thing is a mystery. It is the reason. It is the goal. It will be a deep sacrifice. Also, who is this man? Oh, and one more thing. Defend yourself. We then get Baby Doll fighting three gigantic demon samurai with her sword. <laughs> I'm crying. I'm literally crying. It's just so fucking good. In this third reality, she's kind of invincible. Like they're knocking her around, but she's fighting back. She ain't no diva, is what I would say if I was lying. Also, all of this is happening while Björk is singing. It actually almost pisses me off. No, it does piss me off. It does. Because that mix is not on streaming. It's on YouTube but it's not on Spotify. After she defeats the third samurai, we're back in the second reality and Baby Doll's just finished her dance and everyone's gagged. That night in the dorms, Baby Doll says she has a proposition for the girls. She's got a plan to escape. Are you really gonna try to escape? Yeah, before the high roller comes. Sweet Pea's not having it and she doesn't want her sister Rocket participating in the plan either. In the dressing room, Rocket tells Sweet Pea about how Baby Doll saved her from the cook. And the way she words it is very guardian angel coded. And there she was just like that. She had a knife his throat. She saved me. Interesting. So now Sweet Pea's like, oh, okay, so she is that girl. She is the diva. Let's hear this plan. Okay, ladies, now let's get information. The plan is simple. Map in Blue's office to know how to get out. Fire to provide a distraction and disable the checkpoints. Knife from the kitchen for protection. And Blue's master key, which he keeps around his neck. Sweet Pea says she'll help, but only because they'd get caught without her. And if she says it's over, then they stop. While Blue is distracted watching Baby Doll dance, Sweet Pea copies the map in his office. Okay, so Baby Doll's dance. Whenever she's about to dance, she does this. <laughs> As we've worked out, dancing means entering a third reality, so where are we off to this time? Well, of course, some steam zombie World War II-esque trenches, while White Rabbit plays in the background. That man is back. He tells them to enter the enemy trenches and steal the map. This is crucial, okay, everyone pay attention. Sweet Pea makes this prolonged eye contact with one of the ally soldiers. Save that for later like a squirrel with an acorn. Remember ladies, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Amber's got this super high tech mecha. Okay, Overwatch diva, GG. So they successfully steal the map in this third reality while Sweet Pea copies the map in the second reality. This is all happening in heels, by the way. I don't know why, but whenever I see Vanessa Hudgens doing anything more energy intensive than simply just talking, it makes me want to Olivia Wilde nod. So let's do that. Also, since this is a safe space and we're saying anything, Rocket's hair. I want to eat it. So now we're back in the post-dance second reality. We never actually see Baby Doll do her second reality dance, which I don't think would be as much of a big deal in the theatrical cut because you don't see any of them dance. But in the extended version, we have seen it. So her being singled out as the one that we don't see, inch resting. Blue now wants Baby Doll to dance for the mayor and Madame Golsky's like, nah, she's not ready. But Blue gets what Blue wants. Here's the thing, this show might be yours, but the girls and you are mine. This power dynamic is kind of confusing. Potential spoilers again, raising the flag, we'll talk about it later. Rocket talks to Baby Doll about her relationship with her sister Sweet Pea. The story is that Rocket ran away from home, Sweet Pea followed to protect her, but never actually had an issue with their family. I do find it 11 letter words starting with I that Sweet Pea and Rocket are the only the other story that we find out about how they got into the asylum. We know nothing about how Blondie or Amber got in there. It might make one think, do they even have stories? Are they even real? Blue notices that the copier in his office is warm and that someone has copied the asylum map. Rot roll raggy. So the map's secured, next up is fire. This is when Jamie Chung's Amber steps up to the plate. While Baby Doll's dancing for the mayor, Amber's going to steal his dragon lighter. There's a remix of I Want It All and We Will Rock You. Okay. Your big disgrace. Mm-hmm, yeah. But I still gotta get this lighter. This mare in the second reality is an orderly from the first reality, the one with the lighter. Baby Doll gets on stage and starts. This time in the third reality, we're giving very much Lord of the Rings. Very much orc invasion, very much dragon in the castle. In this third reality, Amber is in charge of flying the chopper. The Amber will keep the bird on stage. Roger that. Starting my run. Which is an interesting parallel to how she's sort of in charge of making sure they get the lighter off the mare. It's parallels. Are you seeing it? The wise man is back and says that their mission is to kill the baby dragon so they can take two crystals out of its neck and strike them together to make a magical fire. 
whatever that means. Now, not to keep saying this is where things get interesting, but this is where things get interesting. The wise man's wise words of advice start to feel more and more out of place, almost like it's all unraveling. For example, Remember, don't ever write a check with your mouth. You can't cash with your ass. What? Oh, okay. who is he? And what's he on about? So the girls drop from the helicopter. <laughs> and they get to work fucking shit up. As I mentioned at the start of the video, in the extended version, we get longer fight scenes, which we are celebrating. We are celebrating. Happy birthday. And also another example about how ridiculous it is that they're running around in these skimpy outfits that is making a point. Perhaps about how women in these movies always have outfits that prioritize sex appeal over actual function. So baby doll Sweet Pea and Rocket kill the baby dragon and get the crystals. But now the mother dragon is pissed and comes after them. <laughs> Okay, ladies, now let's slay this dragon. Merry Christmas to you and yours. The lighter has been secured. So they tape it under a desk in the dressing room along with the map. Blue hears them celebrating and cheersing and comes in like, what are we celebrating? <laughs> No one's hiding anything from me, right? No one went into my office and messed with my shit. No one stole anything off a guest, right? Sweet Pea's like, well, it's over. I'm pulling the plug. Word to Saltburn Bath. Divas, the plan is unraveling. Blue finds Blondie crying to Madame Gorski after he threatened her. Promise you can keep a secret. Yes. Rot roll raggy. Map secured, lighter secured, it's knife time. Sweet Pea's back on board, but again, only because she doesn't want Rocket to get killed. So to get the knife, Baby Doll needs to dance for the chef to distract him. They grab the kitchen radio and she gets to work. This scene only has Baby Doll, Sweet Pea, Rocket, and Amber, so only those four are present in the third reality. This is my favorite third reality, by the way. The wise man says that a bomb codenamed Kitchen Knife is on a hijacked train set to explode when it gets to the city. They need to deactivate the bomb and then steal it. For those who fight for it, life has a flavor. The sheltered will never know. Okay. Miss Satin in the background like, hey girl. When we're all born, Satin somewhere. The fight scenes on this train. Like it just makes you want a Barbie gif. The door opening in the reflection, so it looks like a smile on the mechanized gunman's head. Zack Snyder, I see you and I get it. Oh, here's the Gorgini speed ramped train section you ordered. <laughs> With a side of visuals. Oh, and um, a large serve. Let's be serious for a second. Who speed ramps like Zack Snyder? Anyone? No. So they defeat the droids and deactivate the bomb. But then one of the droids reanimates and overrides the deactivation sequence. So kaboomings are inbound. This coincides with water frying the radio power cable in the second reality, because as we know, the third reality acts as an extension for us representation of what's happening in the second reality. Remember, Madame Gorski said that the dancing is the girl's way of using their weapons to fight. Ray. So the chef realizes what's happening, sees Sweet Pea trying to steal his knife and goes to stab her. Just as the radio starts working again and Baby Doll escapes back to the third reality. But it's all gone to shit. Rocket jumping in front of the knife in the second reality translates to her sacrificing herself to save Sweet Pea, Baby Doll and Amber in the third reality. Get free. Goodbye, Diva. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. You were bigger than the whole sky. We lost a real one today. So they failed the mission. This translates to Rocket being stabbed by the chef in the second reality. In the third reality, she says to Sweet Pea, Promise me two things. The first thing is, I don't get mad about this. And then in the second reality, The second thing is when you get home, you tell mom I love her. 
Okay, so it seems like there's a direct correlation between realities, sometimes even through the dialogue. What's literally so crazy about these third level realities is that they have official law. I feel like no one knows about this, guys. Like, we're breaking new ground. There's these animated shorts on the Warner Brothers YouTube channel that go into the law of each of the third realities. The first one is an evil master of demon samurai draining energy from sacred temples. The second talks about reanimating corpses for this steam-powered army. The third one's about a dragon religion or something. I don't know, I wasn't gagging. The fourth one gagged me a bit. It talks about a class divide between the elite and the proletariat. This oppressed robot class plans to fight back by bombing the city of rich robots, which is when the divas turn up, but it's framed as these freedom fighters being decimated by the girls. Because we all share one fate. All things must come to an end. Like, that is not at all what I expected in terms of background lore. Anyway, Blue storms into the kitchen, flips his shit, tells Sweet Pea it's her fault her sister died, sends her to the closet, tells Amber to get ready for the show. Little does he know that Amber actually successfully swiped the knife. It's now showtime and the High Roller arrives. The High Roller is here. I need you to focus for me. It's John Hamm. Remember the High Roller is lobotomy Dr. John Hamm. Backstage, the girls are in shambles because Rocket has famously freshly departed. Blue has lost the plot. He found out about the escape plan from Blondie. Madame Gorski tries to stand up to him, but he's not having it. He kills Amber, just to make a point. Like, boom. And then he kills Blondie. Boom. Huh? I could not believe it. We've seen that dying in the third reality means dying in the second reality, but does dying in the second reality mean dying in the main reality? Everyone clears out of the dressing room and it's just Blue and Baby Doll. He tries to intimidate her, but she reaches under the desk, grabs the knife, stabs him in the shoulder and steals his key. You'll never have me, ever. <coughs> she saves Sweet Pea from the closet and they use the four things, map, fire, knife, key, to escape. They get outside, but there's a group of people blocking their exit. Baby Doll realizes that the unknown fifth thing needed to escape is her sacrificing herself for Sweet Pea. Now one could say that that is interesting. Yes. She says that Sweet Pea needs to live for all of them and that's how they win. And then she says, This was never my story. It's yours. Oh. Let's go ahead and flag that. So Baby Doll goes and distracts the crowd while Sweet Pea escapes. She steals clothes and finds a bus station. Okay, then we get a scene that is not in the theatrical release. Remember how Second Reality Blue was selling Baby Doll to the High Roller? So she's been captured and she's in a room with the High Roller. And he's talking about how he wants her to want to be with him because that's the only thing money can't buy. Real you, that intangible and undefinable spark that is you. That you I will never know. And yet that is precisely what I want. A true moment in this world of lies. Inch! Resting. She still has some power because no matter what happens, you are the only you and no one can take that from you. In exchange for this true moment, the High Roller will give Baby Doll freedom. Pure and total freedom. Freedom from the drudgery of everyday life. Freedom as abstract ideal. But then we jump back to the main reality and Dr. John Hamm has just lobotomized Baby Doll. So. Is that previous scene a representation of Baby Doll trying to make her situation not as terrible as it is? Or is it a representation of her wanting the lobotomy to happen after everything she's been through, so in a sense taking some of the power back? Or is it just whack? <laughs> There's just so many ways to read it. Whew. Especially when Dr. John Hamm says this. Did you did you see the way she looked at me? Just in that last moment. So that entire scene linking Baby Doll's deflowering in the second reality to her lobotomy in the main reality is not in the theatrical cut. I get why they needed to take it out to make it PG-13, but I feel like it completely changes the movie. In the theatrical cut, we go straight from her sacrificing herself to her in the surgery chair, which is so confusing. Okay, let's keep going. Dr. John Hamm asks Dr. Gorski what the deal was with this girl, and Dr. Gorski says, She stabbed an orderly, started a fire, and, and helped another patient to escape. She also says that she didn't greenlight the procedure, which is how she finds out that Blue forged her signature and orchestrated it all. Dr. John Hamm again mentions that something was off with Baby Doll. Something in her eyes. I've never seen anyone that the way she looked at me. But she wanted me to do it. That with the context of the previous scene with the high roller makes so much more sense. Blue Jones gets arrested after Dr. Gorski calls the police. Sweet Pea boards a bus to escape town, but there's two sets of weirdness. The kid getting on the bus in front of her looks at her like this. This is the kid from the War Trench third reality. Okay. Some rangers try to interrogate her, but the bus driver vouches for her saying she's been on the bus the whole time and he just let her off to use the restroom. The bus driver is the wise man from the third realities. Ooh, 
So she gets on the bus and she escapes. End of movie. Okay, much to discuss. First of all, let's go back to what Dr. Gorski said. Apparently baby doll stabbed an orderly, started a fire and helped someone escape. All things that happened in the second reality. So does that mean everything that happened in the second reality happened in some way in the main reality? So then Rocket, Blondie and Amber were all murdered? How did Blue manage to get away with that and only get caught when Dr. Gorski noticed that her signature had been forged? That links to my third raised flag, the relationship between Blue and Gorski. In the second reality, he holds a lot of power over her, but that doesn't seem to be the case in the main reality. Could that potentially be because the second reality power dynamic is how the person who's dreaming up this club reality sees it. Which brings me to my second flag. Second flag, please. Yes. Whose reality is this? It's kind of open to interpretation, but I think it's Sweet Pea. She's made up this alternate version of events to help herself cope with being in the asylum. Which brings me back to my first flag. First flag, please. Thank you. After all that talk at the start of the movie about guardian angels, is baby doll real? Divas, I have three theories, okay? The first theory is that everything chronologically up until the second reality is real. Baby doll was real, was admitted to the asylum, did all the shit, was lobotomized. At the point we enter the second reality, it's Sweet Pea's perspective of what happened over the week preceding baby doll's lobotomy. So to answer the question of whose story is it, it's Sweet Pea's story, but baby doll is the main character in the second and heroine in the third realities because that's how Sweet Pea sees her as her guardian angel. So everything that happened happened and baby doll helped Sweet Pea escape. I feel like that's my most solid understanding. But a problem with this theory is the kid and the wise man on the bus at the end. How could they be in her made up realities if she hadn't seen them before? Unless she did. Theory number two, Sweet Pea made it all up to cope with what she did and what she did didn't happen in the movie. Baby doll doesn't exist. She's a representation of who Sweet Pea had to be in order to escape her situation. There's some parallels that support this, such as Baby doll accidentally killing her sister and Blue telling Sweet Pea that Rocket's death is her fault. Maybe the kid and the wise man were added to the tale she made up in her head because she'd been on the bus for a while with them. I mean, <laughs> maybe she's giving crazy lady. Theory number three. It's Baby Doll's story, and she made up everything from the point she got admitted to Lennox House. Maybe the girls represent different aspects of her psyche, and she made them up. Well, how is that possible? Dr. Gorski said that someone escaped. Well, to that, I would say we have a sort of unreliable narrator. And that escape could be a metaphor for escaping the real world through being lobotomized. <laughs> Bro. That shit was crazy. And half of what I just said wouldn't even make sense in the theatrical version. I truly, C-H-R-E-W-L-Y, I truly think there's a gem in there somewhere. And you get glimpses of it throughout the movie, but it gets lost in all the things the movie's trying to achieve. Let's go ahead and hashtag release the Snyder Cut. Yes, I need to know what the original vision was. Ugh, guys, so confusing. I kind of need someone to make like a website explaining the movie. That would be so helpful. Mm, you know what's interesting? This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Squarespace gives people a powerful and stylish online platform from which you can build your own website. Squarespace has a huge library of professional website templates with unique designs for every category and use case. And they're also customizable. So you can make changes to the look of the site, update content, and add features to fit exactly what you want to do on your site. If you're looking to set up an online store, Squarespace has the tools you need, whether that's physical, digital, or service products. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So let's get that sale. Another example, if you're looking to present your work, you could use one of Squarespace's portfolio designs to display your projects in customizable galleries, or maybe set up some password protected pages to share private work with clients. So many options, so many opportunities. Wow. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash Mike's Mike. That's M-I-K-E-S-M-I-C to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Bye.